Paul was not anti-law. So much so that the Apostle Paul in Acts 21 did a Nazarite fact. Uh, and there was nothing wrong with Paul doing a Nazarite fact. That was an issue. And he was showing, in fact, in that context, that he was not against the law. What do you mean not against the law? That means he was not against the law as Jewish heritage. And there were still Jews who kept aspects of the law. So much so that when Peter saw a vision in Acts chapter 10, uh, and God showed him all men are fought for the peace, Peter said, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. He's referring to dietary laws in the Old Testament. That ain't the issue. The issue is when you take the law and bind it as a matter of essential. Now that's what they're dealing with in this context. Well, what does that mean for us, Brother Abel? We have to be careful in our brotherhood that we do not become some mutated form of legalists. Where we stop making that essential which God has not made essential. And we start sending withdrawal letters and nasty Facebook posts about folk that we don't like because they've harmed our tradition. We don't want to treat them as if they're out of fellowship. We want to put them on the unofficial withdrawal list. We know we ain't got enough Bible to withdraw biblically, so we make it unofficial and whisper to everybody on telephones and text messages and talk about who ain't really in fellowship and what church you should not go to. And it's got nothing to do with one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It's got to do with whether I clap, Local 
church and tell them to conform to your preference. Back in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, somebody, well, a busload of folk had the audacity to come to our church. Uh, about 30 of them. They came in and um, they were from a, a probably a wonderful church. I think they were a church in, uh, in St. Louis, maybe Kansas City. And they came in and sat down. And, um, you know, at our church, you know, we, we, we are. Uh, well, our church is, is, well, it is what it is. <laughs> and, praise God, if you come to our congregation, it just is what it is. Uh, nothing unscriptural happening. Nothing outside of the boundaries of New Testament Christianity. Nothing that breaks the sacred writ. Nothing. But they are expressive at times. And they happen to come to our worship at an expressive moment. <laughs> so they came in. And when they came in, they sat for about 30 minutes. Our folk were clapping and, and our folk lift hands and occasionally somebody might kneel on the floor. Don't, don't judge us. It, it, it's just, it was one of their moments. And it was, and, and then they were clapping and, and all of that. And the, the 30 folk got up and they walked out. And one of my elders went and chased them. I happened to be out of town. He went and chased them and said, listen, is there a problem? We were wondering why you left. They said, well, y'all have instrumental music. <laughs> so, and my elder said, well, what, what do you mean? We, we don't use mechanical instruments of music. He said, well, well clapping is instruments. <laughs> and, and that's what you have. And your worship is out of order. And it's not lawful. And so definitely not expedient. And so we have decided to depart from this most out of order church. <laughs> now, it was to their blessing that I was not in time. For a couple of reasons. One, I helped them leave. Because there's a whole lot of churches in Atlanta, Georgia, and I would hate for them to be offended by us when they could go to a whole lot of other options. Number two, though, I would have had to ask what was the logic behind this thing? There is nowhere in Scripture where God ever makes comparative clapping and instruments. They are always two different items in scripture. That's number one. Number two, when you start saying out of order, I need to know what verse you quoted. Because if you're quoting not decent and in order, that verse in context is not talking about can you clap or not clap. That verse governs now concerning spiritual gifts. Now if you're fooling with the first word you say all things are lawful, and everything's not expedient. Well, we abuse that too. There's a church. Uh, I believe in the Bible, there are principles of expedience without question. But with that verse, in 1 Corinthians 6, when he says all things are not lawful, Paul was writing about the disposition of the Corinthians, that they believed everything was permitted. The antithetical statement was, but all things are not expedient. That's Paul's disposition that what you claim is lawful is really not beneficial. Now, when you keep reading the next verse, they said, Corinthians, food is good for the stomach. Stomach is good for food. This was their idea that it was all right to fulfill your bodily appetites. The Corinthians were going down to the temples, sleeping with prostitutes under the notion that everything is permitted. Paul then says, to help you understand, all things are not permitted, free fornication. That's what that verse is doing. Now church, uh, what I'm suggesting is, at the very least, and you're going to say, I'm not telling you to accept what I'm saying, go look at it. What I'm suggesting is, we have to stop Taking verses out of their context and then making it applicable to what it does not apply to. If there is no corresponding application, which means that the situation in the text matches the situation you're dealing with, then you can't try to force an application. Right. That's true. I'm done. Go back to Galatians 5. Go back to Galatians 5. I promise I'm done. 
application. That was all application, right? Yeah, you, you ain't got to fool with that. I mean, I'm right, but you don't have to fool with that. Um, you don't have to fool with that. Go to Galatians 5. All right, go to Galatians 5. Because that was what I'm helping you to see, church, is that in our present day fellowship, we have congregations of the Lord's church that have deemed many out of fellowship that are not out of fellowship. And we've got to be careful about coming to conclusions about matters of what you've heard but you ain't really studied it. If you haven't studied it, be quiet until you study it. And that, that goes for lay members, it goes for preachers. Uh, it, preachers, we have to be careful about how we jump to a conclusion before we have investigated the boundaries of Scripture. Because it might be it's against your preference, not against Scripture. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, if that's Scripture, let me finish this here. It may really be about your preference. And I can you, I have preferences. Y'all have preferences. But at least be Christian enough to admit it's a preference. That's all that it say. That is my preference. It's better to say that than to send somebody to hell over a subject you did not study. Uh, all right, now, uh, come here, let me finish this. Look at verse 4. Look, look at verse 4. Well, there's 3 and 4 push my point. Um, and I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. There it is. That's the legality of the Mosaic law. He, if he keeps one point of the law, he is obligated to keep the entire law. That is a legal system. The New Testament is a law, but it's not a legal law. It's not a law in the same sense as the Mosaic law. Are you following that? The Mosaic law says you offend in one point, you are guilty of the whole system. You are obligated to keep the whole law. Watch this. Verse 4. You who have been severed from Christ. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law. No definite. Do you notice no definite article? Those of you who are seeking to be justified by law. Not the law. Although the context is Mosaic. But he's using the nature of legality. Those of you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. When you attempt to be justified on the basis of your own righteousness, you have left grace. You have missed that. And we use this verse for a lot of stuff too. When we wanted to teach that one is not saved, one saved, always saved, we quoted to show that you can't fall from grace. That's true. But in this context, what he's talking about is if you place yourself under a legal system and depend on your own righteousness, then you're telling God, I didn't need your grace. All right. That's right. You have left the safety of your salvation because you decided to depend on the perfection of your own righteousness. That's why Paul said in Titus chapter 3, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by mercy he saved us. Amen. By the mercy of regeneration. So that, that, that helps you understand in the context of the Galatians doctrine. And I try to give you an overview. Is that when you study the Galatians doctrine, the another gospel in this context is a gospel that suggests justification by works. Yeah. That is a heteros that's not an alas. It's a gospel, but Paul said, whoever teaches that, let him be a curse. Principally, when you make essential what is not essential, then you create, listen to me, the minute you create a law, you create a sin. Because in sin is transgression of the law. Then the minute you make a law, you simultaneously made a sin. So we have made more sins than the Bible records. Y'all not hearing me. We got more sins than God has on his mind. Y'all are not 
hearing me. The minute you make a law, you create sin. I got enough struggle with the sins God mentioned than to have to deal with yours too. Are you following me now? So hey, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm not talking about the essentiality of baptism. I am not talking about the pattern of New Testament worship. I am not talking about anything related to the essentials of the Christian faith. I'm talking about leave me alone when I have joy. I'm talking about don't condemn me if I got more, more than one mic. I'm talking about if I clap and you don't clap, we can still be in fellowship. That's what I'm talking about. Now, if you tell me Jesus didn't get up from the grave, now we got to sign a proposition. If you tell me baptism is not essential, now we got to sign a proposition. If you tell me that the worship of the New Testament church does not include the Lord's Supper, then we got a proposition. I'm not talking about essentials. I'm talking about non-essentials that we argue about that have nothing to do with what the apostles have revealed. As I close, talk shop. I'm saved by grace. I'm glad I'm saved by grace. And if I'm going to be a defender of faith, then I can't just defend against liberalism. I have to also defend against legalism. Because some folk, their issue is not unrighteousness, their issue is self righteousness. Some folk are self righteous, not just unrighteous. We need to defend against the liberal concepts when folk try to break from the New Testament pattern. Those who try to indicate that salvation is outside of a proper obedient faith, now we've got to deal with that. That's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about now are those who have taken, listen, and this is what we don't like this, who took our heritage and made it law. And the heritage we have, we received from a Caucasian culture. That's, that's no attack on Caucasians. I am giving you a historical fact that how we worship relative to our expressiveness has been arrested by a Caucasian culture that used verses like man is not worship with hands out of Acts 17 that has nothing to do with class. But a Caucasian culture taught you to be like that. It ain't natural for none of y'all to sin and act like you ain't got no joy. Somebody taught you to act like that. Because when you go to that football game and your son is running up and down the court, and all of a sudden you lose all of your control and you know what joy looks like. Only in the church do we have no concept of expressive joy. Who taught you that? And let me give it. Now, now here's what some expression people don't like. You don't have to be expressive to worship. Just because a person's not expressive does not mean they're not worshiping. And just because they are not as expressive as you are, do not indicate that somehow they don't have joy. The reverse is, it's okay if I have joy and want to express it. So the expressive and the non-expressive can worship in the same place. When Obama, Barack Obama was running in his first uh, run, uh, Barack Obama took my daughter, and I may have told you the story, I took my daughter to see him because I thought it was a great moment for African Americans. Regardless of your political persuasion, that's not even what it was. For me, it was the historical moment of a first African American president. So I took my daughter to go see him. And we walked in there, and the folk were shouting. They were jumping and electric. 
shout for Obama. And my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, uh, why is everybody acting like that? I said, baby, it's because of who he is. I said, because historically, he will be the first black president. This has gendered excitement in this place. When Barack had entered the building, he wasn't in the room yet, but he entered the building. Everybody went quiet. And my daughter said, why are they so quiet? <laughs> I said, baby, because of who he is. The same reason they jumped is now the same reason they quiet. So quietness did not mean they weren't excited. It just meant they were anticipating. Are y'all following that? So when he walked in, everybody erupted again. And before long, I started jumping. And my daughter looked up and said, Daddy, what you jumping for? I said, baby, it's because of who he is. But then I caught myself and said, if I could shout on a sinner like this, then I know somebody else that ought to get me excited. I know somebody else that ought to make me jump. I know somebody else that makes me want to shout and I'll shout for Jesus because I know who he is. I know who he is. And that's why you get excited. It's not the money in my account. It's who he is. It's not the car I drive. It's who he is. Him right now, y'all better come with me. Because when I think about his grace and I think about his mercy, something jumps all over me and I can't help myself. Be back to life. And now when I get excited, I can't stop jumping. I can't stop shouting because Jesus did something for me that nobody else would. I'm coming here to tell you, if I get excited, just excuse me, because I'm thankful for what Jesus has done. I am done. If, if you're here tonight, and, and you are not a Christian, then be mindful that the Bible teaches that there is one spiritual organism that's called the body of Christ. That Paul affectionately called churches of Christ, churches of God, the house of God, the temple of God, all referring to Jesus' established New Testament organization. And if you're here and you want to be in that church, you can come by faith in him and what he did at Calvary's cross. Believe that to be true. Repent of your sin, confess Christ, and then be immersed in the water for the remission of your sins. And God said he will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he gives his spirit to all them that obey him. If you're a Christian and you're a child of God, I beckon you, love the brotherhood. Learn to be tolerant with stuff that may go against your preference. Thank God there are many congregations. There's no need for you to think that when you come to a congregation, that whole congregation is going to conform to your preference. If everybody in there clapping and you the only one that don't, don't think that the whole church is going to stop because that's your point. And if you don't mind me saying this, the whole, where I preach and where I worship, I tell them all the time, every church don't do it like this. So don't go to another congregation expecting this expression of worship. 
make sure they're worshiping according to the power. But also make sure you got your preference in check. And God will certainly bless us. Let's all stand together. Such a thorough and complete dissertation of not only Galatians chapter 5, but a contextual, historical, uh, cultural, uh, etymological, uh, the whole circle of context presented here tonight with Galatians 5 as its foundation. Not only did he treat his topic, but he certainly treated the theme of this entire lectureship, I'm free. Yeah. Let's give him a love to yeah. To Harlem for the last many months. Amen. And that is simply this. This relegates, as all matters do, to what then does the Bible teach? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's what all matters really need to. Yes, sir. Amen. And I have said to our congregation, as I have many, many times to Dr. Haywood, as I have many, many times to folk across the, our entire brother. The Harlem Church of Christ, we do not have multiple songs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That has nothing to do with whether it is scriptural Amen. or not. Yes, sir. Amen. The Harlem y'all acting like y'all ain't never heard me say that. <laughs> We don't have base at all. But that has nothing to do with whether it is scriptural or not. Now what I have said to Harlem is I don't feel that this is conducive to the culture of our yeah. congregation. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But I'm very clear in my mind about what the Bible is. I'm clear that there's a difference between preference right. and what the Bible teaches. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So let, let, me say, let me say to you what I have said to this congregation, and I say it since uh, this whole can of worms has been opened. <laughs> uh, there are no sun leaders. They're not in the Bible. A song leader is not an addition. A song leader is an aid. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't find one song leader in the Bible. That's the reason why you cannot find ten. What then does the Bible do? You understand? What does the Bible do? And so this is what I've said, and, and many of you uh, <coughs> who will be seeing this tonight on Facebook, yeah, 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 yeah. on YouTube, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a theological consideration, yes, sir. not an emotional one. Yeah. Uh, I have no access to grind with anyone. Uh, I have no battles. Uh, well, let me qualify that, because I'm going to qualify that. That's <laughs> But I do not have, nor do I encourage. Now I'm going to tell Harlem something you don't know. Our leadership three weeks ago, for the first time in the 17 years that I've been here, called me into a meeting. <laughs> not, 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 not in a condescending way. You know, not in a negative way. Not at all. But to ask me the question, why do we not have praise team in Harlem? Why can we not have one? I thought it was a very mature question. I think it's a good question. All right. They asked, why can we not have basin in our world? And I told them, because it is not conducive to the culture of this congregation. Yeah. All right. And I'm not going to do anything to disrupt the culture. Right. Right. 
a congregation where I preach. I am not the minister of the millennials. I am not the minister of the baby boomers. I am not the minister of the aged builders. I'm everybody's minister. I have to look out for the sanity, for the salvation of everyone. So while the thing may be lawful, it does not mean it is expedient. Are y'all all right? Are y'all all right? Uh, so I just want to be clear about it. Now, uh, now you all know where I stand. In, in, in theory. In theory. Now, Dr. Hayward, I want to ask you probably. Will you join or participate? I'm inviting you in a round table with our brotherhood to discuss these divides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will you be a part of a round table? Two nights in Dallas, two nights in Atlanta. Would you be willing to do it? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So we have been discussing this uh, about eight or nine gospel preachers from across the country. Perhaps it's time that we come together and with the spirit of Christ, what then does the Bible teach? Now, I believe that information is power. And if we give the information to people, yeah, yeah. perhaps so many won't be lost. Yeah. Perhaps we can save some souls yeah. who are stumbling yeah. over these issues. Yeah. Are y'all all right? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead on and ask for a round table in Dallas. And a combination round table in Atlanta, Georgia. Yes, sir. Four nights of discussion where we can discuss and provide written documentation about what the Bible teaches for you, the people. Yeah. Then you can decide yeah. what is in your best interest. Are y'all all right? Yeah. So I'm going to be calling a number of gospel preachers, a very fine preachers on both sides of these positions. Some, some who feel like folk on their way to hell yeah. when they clap their hands. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some, some who believe folk who teach these kind of things are heretics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's invite. We say we are Christians. Y'all miss that. <laughs> Say we're Christian. Can you walk the walk? Yes, sir. Don't just talk to talk. I don't have to get nasty with people. I know why I believe what I believe. 